everybody and welcome to the Squiggly Careers podcast. This is a very exciting podcast this week. It is our Christmas party podcast. Woohoo! Uh, that was Sarah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but there are other people that could go woohoo that we've got in the studio. <laughs> um, there you go, it's not just us. It's not just us. Um, we are joined by some people that we are delighted have come on this podcast with us because they have some amazing initiatives they're involved in, organisations that they run, and we want to talk to them about their years, what's been going on, make you aware of how they're making work better and just have a bit of fun on the Christmas Party podcast. So shall we introduce you to who's in the room other than myself and Sarah? So let's start with James and Tom. Could you please introduce yourself to our audience and let us know how you make work better? I certainly can. So my name is Tom Caulfield. Uh, I am the co-founder of two companies, the first one being the Tempest 2, which is all around adventure and showing that ordinary people can achieve amazing things. And secondly, Dose, which I'll let James introduce. So Dose is a workplace company that tries to put into practice the lessons and learnings we've taken from these adventures, from rowing 3,000 miles across the Atlantic to climbing the 3,000-foot wall of El Capitan. And Tom and I are unique in the sense that we've got no history or record of doing any of these things before <laughs> we try to attempt them. We're rubbish at everything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So um, that's Dose and the Tempest 2, I think. Great. And Lauren? My name is Lauren Curry and I run two companies. So I'm the managing director of Nobel in Europe. We are a team based in London and we are organisational designers and organisational psychologists who help teams and leaders design their work culture. And I also run Upfront, and Upfront is on a mission to change confidence and public speaking for women. Thank you so much for being here with us. And we get to dig into that a little bit more as well. And last but not least, Lizzie. I'm the co-founder of Hoxby and we're a purpose-led organisation. So we exist to create a happier, more fulfilled society through a world of work without bias. And we do so by bringing together our team of a thousand amazing Hoxbys to deliver projects for some of the biggest clients in the world, like Unilever, Amazon, AIA, but all with this purpose in mind. And I've been uh, part of the Hoxby Slack community for a little while. It's my favourite Slack community. Like the spirit of Hoxby lives in that Slack community. It's amazing. It is amazing. It's amazing. something special. <laughs> so we thought it would be good to start by reflecting on 2019 so far and start on a real high and think about what has really given all of our guests energy this year. What have been those moments where you have felt in flow, where you've just felt brilliant and they can be really small moments they could be really big moments and kind of everything in between so Lauren I was thinking we've met a few times yes and you've sort of described two of the things that you do but you're also trustee for the design council but you also run something that I love that's called letter love shop which is illustrations which are incredible I definitely encourage you to follow them on Instagram but my favorite thing about all of the different things that you do is how you kind of sum them up and you say that your philosophy is doing, not talking. Mm. Now, I appreciate there's a little bit of irony this morning that we're going to make you talk about those things. But, you know, we're sort of doing it at the same time. Yeah. And what I'm so interested to know is, out of all of those things, is there something that has united all of those things, that has given you energy this year? Has one of them given you loads more energy than another? Has it been a combination of factors? What have been those kind of highlights and just moments of goodness for you so far? Yeah, it's a lovely question. And I think... You know, they're all different shapes and sizes and sometimes those things go through peaks and troughs, which is kind of where the time thing comes in because obviously, you know, you can't spend all day doing all of those things. Um, But I think the kind of red thread that runs through all of them is this idea of taking action and kind of recognising the power that you have to make change. I think Greta Thunberg and the, the work that she has done this year has just fueled me I think forevermore I'm just so inspired by what that has shown about the power of one person's voice and is it when you've then taken actions almost whether they are big small or in between that you feel like oh that's where you get your moments of feeling really energized yeah so this year I've been writing a lot more I think I've written the most this year I've ever written before and that's given me a lot of energy and I feel like once you It's like the more you do, the easier it is to keep going. But that kind of blank page that I know we all feel the fear from sometimes can be the scariest place to start. And I've also started doing live videos, Mm -hmm. which means putting my face on the internet in real time, (laughs) which did feel a bit scary before. And I've kind of taken a leap into 
you know, that new behaviour of being visible because I think that is a really powerful way of doing and taking action that can inspire others. So those two things um, have felt really good this year. In some ways, they're quite solitary. Like writing mm. is quite solitary. Recording to camera, even though there's an audience watching you, it's quite a solitary thing. Mm-hmm. But it's still an energising thing for you to do that independent of a team with you at the, at the time of doing it. It is, but funnily enough, I do have on my drains, which I know we'll get to, and a big theme for me this year has been isolation. Like I do think building businesses and being someone who creates and produces a lot can be quite lonely Mm. and quite isolating, especially now that I'm a parent and I can't kind of rock up to events in the evening the way that I used to and I don't live in central London the way I used to. So those things combined have made me realise that actually I do need to be a bit more conscious about making sure I spend time in real life with people, Mm. what we're doing today. (laughs) And for anyone listening, if you follow Lauren on LinkedIn, I would say her articles are some of the most thoughtful and insightful that I've read this year. Um, They are always the ones that get the little, you know, the flag thing that you can do on LinkedIn to save them. Pretty much all of the things that you write, I put in there because I just think they are things that you will come back to and share. So if it's something you're interested in, I would really encourage you to follow Lauren because they are not just sort of things that you just spurt at the moment. I always feel like they're very well researched and probably you bring your design mindset, I guess, Mm. to to the things that you do. Thank you. So James and Tom, I feel like you are going to put us all to shame, essentially, (laughs) because you do these really big things and you say, oh, you know, you're really ordinary, but then you do these extraordinary things that are incredibly hard. And I was thinking a bit about what you talk about in terms of what unites the different activities that you do. And you talk about taking on adventures that you can't do yet. And I think that's such a nice growth mindset statement. Big adventure, but I can't do it with that nice little kind of yet at the end. And obviously this year, you mentioned in your introduction, you have climbed El Capitan, which for people who don't know, is in Yosemite. It's essentially a, just a sheer vertical massive rock is the best way to describe <laughs> exactly it. What it like, is, yeah. I've been to Yosemite and you don't climb them. You just look at them and go, yeah, it looks steep. Maybe I'll see a bear. And that's it. Then you go and get a cup of coffee and, you know, go on to Napa Valley or wherever. Um, we did so that as well. Oh, OK, fine. Um, and, you know, during that, you spent 72 hours vertical which is just a bit insane. So talk to me about in all of that process, because I know there's an incredible amount of preparation as well as that kind of one moment in time where you're doing it. What gives you energy to make those things happen? I think we like and really enjoy the learning process. Mm -hmm. And that's why we keep replicating and always start from the point of total novice to set a lofty goal. And we like having that focus of climbing El Capitan or getting to Barbados, whatever it is, that driving force definitely brings us joy and a bit of direction. I think we get lots of energy from messages that we get from people. So whether it's people like yourself or anyone who sees what we're doing and the situations we're putting ourselves through, the messages are a huge source of strength for us. And they're big energy givers. And we say it thanks to the messages. It means a lot, but it genuinely makes a massive difference. People say it in the training and stuff as well, and that trickles through to the the workshops and the keynotes that we do and just seeing the impacts that we have, try and see what's possible if you remove can't, trying to embody that and seeing it, people react positively to it and even people reacting worried about it. It's all energy givers for us, I think. Yeah, and again, that's quite remote, I would guess, for a lot of you, because a lot of the time, because a lot of those messages are through social media. Yeah, most of them. Yeah, and I think over the last couple of weeks, actually, I've spoken to a lot of people who are talking about how detrimental and negative social media can be, which I can see. But for you, maybe it's been the other the other way around. Yeah, I guess when when we started the Tempest Two, so we wrote our business plan in a hurricane in our rowing boat when we were on the Atlantic. <laughs> sure, the sure. Worst business plan ever written of all time. And we're like, right, we'll be full time adventurers and make money from Instagram and do this and that. And that's kind of how we perceived the Tempest Two going. And we worked with brands on Instagram, the hashtag ad, hashtag spawn, and. We hated being in that confined box of you have to say this about the product and whatnot. Mm. And the business is totally U-turn. We use Instagram now whenever we feel like we have something to say. We won't just post about our breakfast or this is me doing this for no reason. And when we were on LCAT, we pretty much had signal for the whole thing. So all 72 hours, we're just totally, totally honest. So when we are absolutely knackered and scared, we'll say it. We won't try and you know, put a brave face on and be like, no, we're okay. We're actually like, oh, I'm going to cry. I'm scared of being a thousand feet up. And I think 
We use Instagram to just basically as a shop window to us. We don't filter anything. Some people like it. Some people maybe don't. But I think if one person can watch our content and then go away and be like, if those two idiots can go do that, then why can't I go and do this? Yeah, and actually, Jill, I think that's what it does for me. When I, I don't want to climb El Capitan, to be no, very don't, clear. don't do um, it. It didn't actually look that fun. I was like, it just looks, <laughs> looks really hard. You don't really get to sleep, and it looked quite scary. But it definitely puts me in the mindset of thinking, well, what are the really big things I would like yeah. to achieve? And if I didn't put limits on myself, what might that look like? Yeah. And I think I probably share something with you in terms of going, I get energy from just imagining that and visualising what that could be. And then I usually wait until the end of the year and then tell Helen and hope that she sort of goes yeah that sounds like we could do that for our business <laughs> I sort of come with this mass honestly I rock up to our end of year reviews we'll prioritize them. <laughs> with a massive book full of like here are the really big kind of imaginings that I don't think we can do yet and we're usually quite far away from them just but, to be clear on that, Sarah does actually have a really big notebook. <laughs> it's, like, it's not just like, like an A5 or an A4. It, honestly, <laughs> it's A1. It is A1. doesn't even fit in her bag. <laughs> and she brings it. And um, and then we put it onto post-its and then I order it. There's some kind of logic yeah, and then, in our and process. <laughs> and then Helen like looks at the practicals and is like, OK, let's just talk about this. <laughs> um, so on that energy point, I'm really interested in what's like your... Your it's a bit of a fantastic thing, but your high of the year, like the thing that gave you the most energy, was it being on top of El Capitan, or was it actually the energizing thing was the bit leading up to it, or after? Yeah, it's interesting actually. I think um, it was actually slightly anticlimactic when we got to the top because for eighteen months, all we think about, all we talk mm. about, all we're mm. training for is this moment, and you, it's definitely ego driven as well. We imagine the end of stuff, so like we get to the top and we're these amazing climbers and the sun <laughs> setting and everyone's cheering. <laughs> Where in reality, we get to the top, we... Look, there's no one there, yeah, presumably. Yeah, there's tired. no one there. We are absolutely, we look like a state. There's no one cheering and it's pitch black. So it's slightly anticlimactic in that sense. But I think we've got most pleasure, actually, since being back. Okay. Because we spent a month living in a van in Yosemite. We had a month full of anxiety and fear. Then we came back and you kind of appreciate... Just like stuff like this, like a mince pie or <laughs> being able to speak to someone without being constantly worried that in two weeks you're going to fall off a cliff. Yeah. Um, so I think coming back has actually been the nice thing rather than the actual completion of it, which yeah. is slightly different to other ones. It's a great source of like perspective. It mm. puts everything into perspective. And with the, the ones that we've done previous, we've always asked our question immediately, what now, what now, like trying to change. Yeah, I saw you doing that in the pub, adventure. around here somewhere, I <laughs> yeah, reckon yeah, that yeah. pub was. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think this time is slightly different, that we are quite content in what we've done as well and quite enjoying this process of enjoying the small things and figuring out what the next thing is for us and what charity we're going to work with next and the schools that we're going to talk at, just basically enjoying the really small things, the day-to-day things, and it's quite good for that. That's yeah. really nice, actually, to have that big thing, but actually then just to really zoom in on the small things, or I could imagine that anticlimactic thing would be really destabilizing, mm. but to know that that's how you're going to approach it yeah, is probably quite rejuvenating. Yeah. Definitely. So on to Lizzie. Uh, I presume, Lizzie, you also wrote your business plan in a hurricane, right? With that <laughs> that was sure. I mean, who, who, sure. who doesn't do that? <laughs> that's <a> standard. <laughs> um, so I became aware of Hoxby, I think, about three or so years ago now at an awards ceremony. Oh. And then uh, the Women in Marketing Awards yep. ceremony. Yep. And then got in touch with Lizzie and Alex afterwards and like, so about that award that I was on this judging panel for, it, I was like, great, I'm so glad that you got that award. But also, could I talk to you? Because I think I would quite like to be part of your brilliant community that I'm now aware of. And Hoxby, and it started out as Hoxby Collective, right? And now yep. recently, I guess that's Just Hoxby now. Just yep. Hoxby, yep. so maybe yep. that's interesting yep. in this year. Yep. A big change. But growing rapidly, yep. a community of a thousand freelancers yep. globally, I think connected by this spirit of a world of work without bias, but everyone defining their own work style. I mean, it sounds like chaos, but it's not. It's a beauty of people working in a way that works for them. And you're the yep. conduit for the community and also the work that that community works on. Yep, I am the Helen Tupper in your guys' relationship. I'm the organised one, so it's not. Oh no, you're sitting next to each other. <laughs> so plan. Alex has all the big ideas. Um, no, it's not chaos. It's like organised chaos, mm. but it's incredibly inspiring. There's something a bit magical about it that there are a thousand people, the vast majority of whom Alex and I have never met, but everyone has their own story to tell. And I think for me, the energy gains in 2019 have been in two areas around, for the first time, clients starting to come to us, big businesses saying, 
But we've heard about work style and we think it's exciting for business as well as exciting for individuals. And we want to understand how that can fit in our business, how we can essentially re-engineer the way we engage people in order to accommodate that so that their work can fit around their lives rather than the other way around, but also so they're more productive. But secondly... And probably the thing that gives me the most energy is the Hoxbees. So we've doubled the size of our community in the last year and we have a tough application process to get in. So we've had 20,000 applications. So the number of people that have appetite and enthusiasm to join. But for me, more than that, it's about the personal stories. And every now and then within our Slack community, which is our office, we have no offices, Alex and I will get a direct message from someone about having suffered from depression or alcoholism or illness. We have people with chronic illness, carers, issues with their children um, who have disabilities. Those messages move me to tears sometimes. You know, those messages make you think, we're doing this to change the world of work for the better, but we're also doing this to impact individual lives. And Mm -hmm. if we can just change one or two lives, then it's all worth it. That's what it's all about. So for me, that is the constant source of of energy from Hoxby, which is incredible. And to the point of Sarah saying that she saved Lauren's post on LinkedIn, I laugh out loud at the Hoxby. <laughs> oh, yeah, Hoxby. They're really funny. They're so, really funny. Uh, Lizzie and co-founder Alex do quarterly business updates. And also you do your Hoxby... Like, well, you do work style freestyle. Work style freestyle. Inspired by you guys. guys. like them. They're um, yeah. inspired by you guys. Video. Very no filter. Very no <laughs> filter. There's some, there's some lunging. Logic. I'm in a swimsuit and a swimming hat. For some of them. <laughs> and then the all-in-one like morph suit for the green oh, morph suit. Yeah. One, oh, you, I mean, you have to. We will link to some of them because <laughs> you know business updates. How you get everybody interested in business updates, not necessarily just the finance team or the leadership mm. team. Produce updates like Hoxby because the way that you and Alex talk about the numbers and engage people, and it's it's funny, but it's truthful and meaningful, and it's got all the same information in as a dry report, but it's just the energy and how engaging it's delivered. I think people must love them. So love what you do is one of our values. So all of our values are explicit. They're not just words, because in a virtual community, you have to be clear what you're talking about. And we feel that working should be fun. You spend a lot of your life working. And so we try and bring that to everything that we do. And Work Style Freestyle, which is our vlog, that was inspired by you guys, because I think we realise that what you're doing is what you're taking your private conversations and you're making them public Aww. and so work style freestyle are two minute videos that we release every week they basically show how alex and i know how to have a laugh but how we also are trying to change the world of work for the better and talk a lot about our causes and stuff as well so mm, they're brilliant they're brilliant we will link to lots of them <laughs> one of the things actually i'm really interested in is you know we talked about businesses so got tom and james um lizzie you run your business with a guy called alex so, Lauren, you don't run a business with another person, as in you're the managing director, certainly mm-hmm. of Nobel across Europe. And having been in a managing director role myself versus having been in like bigger teams in big organisations, I found that quite a lonely place mm-hmm. to be, a surprisingly lonely place to be, actually. I thought I was in a company, exactly yeah. like you are, but suddenly there's the kind of the expectation and the kind of slight isolation of that, plus your points on you are doing quite a few activities which are just solo endeavours in terms of kind of actually producing that work Mm -hmm. do you find that you know you seek to actively collaborate with people to kind of overcome some of those challenges of perhaps running those things by yourself or how have you changed your approach over the last year or so yeah it's a good question and I think with Nobel I almost have the best of both worlds and that we you know we are a global agency so our teams are small like Mm -hmm. intentionally small I think our biggest team is about eight people so we've got a team in New York team in LA team in San Francisco team in Vancouver and myself I've got probably two or three people who work not Mm full-time project by project basis so I do have that support it just comes at the wrong time (laughs) because when I'm trying to wind down to stop Uh, for the evening like practically at the wrong time they're all starting to wake up the upside of that is I can put an ask out for, you know, I might need something to be edited or get support on a methodology that I'm working on and I wake up in the morning and it's done. <laughs> um, so there are pros and cons. And I think it's, for me, I'm seeing it as, you know, I spent the first phase of my career in a studio surrounded in lots of people all the time, you know, very kind of in real life collaboration and hustle. And I think this is a phase which does suit being a parent more Mm -hmm. for me and that I have much more control over 
my time and also where I spend my time. So Your work style? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, work style yeah. So whether that's in a cafe or working at home. But I do, I mean, especially, you know, looking at your collaboration at Amazing If, I do definitely need a Helen in my life because I have walls full of <laughs> grand ambitions um, and organisation is not my forte. So, yeah, I do feel a bit jealous listening to your stories. <laughs> well, I think she's not she's not available to loan, just to, be, just to be very clear before people start stealing her. You need her. I need, yeah, I just imagining the organised chaos going to chaos and I don't think that'd be a good thing for anyone. <laughs> So you're saying, Lauren, that sometimes you found that hard um, over the last year. And I think one of the things I want to for us all to kind of share a bit now with our listeners is certainly on the surface, all four of you, super shiny, incredible achievements. If I go onto any of your LinkedIn profiles, obviously I was doing that in my stalker research. <laughs> people would put you all on a pedestal because you've done some really fantastic things. And I think it's so important to show the not so mm-hmm. shiny side. And we were even laughing before starting this podcast today in that I nearly wasn't here because having asked everybody to come and give us their time, my little boy, uh, not very well at the moment, inevitably the same day that my partner has a board meeting. So my mum has genuinely driven two hours to my house to make sure that I can be here. I think we should raise a glass to Sue. We should. Thank Cheers. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And you know, when you just think this potentially, if you see the posts about this, it will all look really fun and energetic. But potentially there was a moment at one o'clock this morning, I can show the WhatsApp message, mm-hmm. when I was thinking, oh, this could be difficult. And it is really hard, like combining <laughs> running your own thing and those moments where ideally you do physically need to be there with, you know, living somewhere I don't live particularly near any family has, has been really hard. So I'm kind of interested to know how are you finding this kind of first two years? Because, you know, I find it quite hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like that's a whole other podcast that I can yeah, talk probably. about forever. I mean, the short answer is it's really, really, really hard. Yeah. And being away, you know, my partner's from Liverpool, so his family are in Liverpool, okay, my yeah. family are in Scotland. You know, London just doesn't seem to be a city where people want to pop in. I keep saying to mum, all I want is somebody to come and make me a lasagna. Like, I, <laughs> that's just what Small I want. Come and make you a lasagna. Small oh. That's quite specific though, Lauren. <laughs> Any hot, cheesy food. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Cheese, hot cheese, carbohydrate. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, with all these things, there's a trade-off. And, mm. you know, we've made a very conscious choice to have work opportunity and creative possibilities even over being close to our family and friends who would love to come and make me a lasagna, but they're too far away. And, you know, I really try and talk as openly and honestly as I can about the kind of behind the gloss of what you see, especially when it comes to, you know, being a mother specifically and birth and how your body changes and your identity changes and what that means for your work. And I think all we can do is be open and honest that, you can be shiny and you can yep. be doing good work and have days where you lie on your sofa all day and mm. have crises in the middle of the night where you have to text somebody to come and help you or whatever it might be. Like those two things can go together. You're not one or the other. And yeah. Lisa, you've got three and you, you made a choice to move Haven't outside. you got twins? Yeah. yeah I've oh, got twin God. two-year-olds and a five-year-old. I'm yeah. in the eye of the storm. I yeah, you say. are. Yeah. Oh, my work is my break. <laughs> you're looking You're looking very calm. Yeah, how are you even here? dressed? What's here? Yeah. secret? <laughs> but you moved out, out of London, didn't you? To, yeah, um, I live in Bristol. And oh, we're it, all cool kids. Mm. Yeah, it is cool. It's, it is. It's a bit hard to keep up in <laughs> Bristol because it's so cool. But I think what Lauren says, that is exactly why we want work style to be mm-hmm. the norm. You shouldn't need to choose yeah. to move away from your support network in order to have the career that you want to have. And location is just one of the elements of work style. It's essentially being judged on where you are when actually you should be judged on the output regardless of where and when you work. And I work three days a week. My challenge is working three days a week. Mm-hmm. You know, I that is the right balance for me. And Alex, my business partner, he also works three days a week. So we both have that. He's got young kids as well. But I find it incredibly hard. Like last week on Wednesday morning, I woke up and I was like, right, out of work mode now and into looking after three small children. But that's hard because I'm deeply passionate about my work, but I'm also deeply passionate Mm. about my family and how you dedicate yourself to both perfectly. There just isn't enough time in the week Mm. to do that. I think for me, the drain 
this year has been the same as every year. I'm just going to share some stats with you. So 86% of parents want to work flexibly, but only 49% do. You probably know we're 202 years away from getting to equal pay in terms Mm -hmm. of gender equality still, if we keep going the way we are. 15.4 million working days are lost in the UK alone as a result of work-related stress, anxiety and depression. I feel like the thing that is the drain for me is the scale of the task ahead of us. You know, at Hoxby, we are trying to change the world. We're trying to make work style the norm. We're trying to create a truly new way of working. And sometimes I feel like we're just not moving fast enough. We're not making enough progress. We want to, within our lifetime, see that change to become the norm. And maybe we're not moving fast enough. But then on a Wednesday or on a Thursday when I'm looking after my kids, I'm with my kids and that's just me. So I need to be okay with that. But I find that balance really hard to strike. Can I add a stat to your yeah. list, Lizzie? So there's 80,000 women a year lose their jobs when they become pregnant. And I think that is a huge part of why we need to make work better because there are the structures and the systems that we are working within right now we are designed with men in mind. And yes, we're making amazing progress, but those structures are really, really powerful and strong. And I think that's where we feel that technology, societal expectations of work, globalisation, we're at a tipping point now where you can be judged on your output. Mm -hmm. And that creates suddenly a level playing field. It's not a case of lean in, behave differently. Mm -hmm. It's a case of you are judged purely on your output rather than anything else. And I think that is something that organisations will hopefully start to see brings competitive advantage, makes them more productive, as well as being better for society. But I think every now and then you meet someone that is not engaged behind that at all. And I think, what are we doing? Mm, You know, we're not there yet. I think that's one of the things I often worry about is that there's a bit of an echo chamber of people who get it. And then yeah. often that you're not speaking to the people who don't. And I think that's one of the things that I want to do more of next year is almost to embrace the difficult conversations. I was at a really good event last week where a CEO said that the way in her business that they've made most radical change is actually by really opening up to people who are almost like the furthest away from kind of what you mm. think. And remind me, I will link, there's a really good Ruth Whitman article on why we should all lean out, mm-hmm. um, Amazing. which is um, very good. One of the things that I'm really interested in is scaling impact. So a lot of what you've talked about there, I think whether you work three days or five days, that doesn't necessarily solve the scaling of the impact. Yep. It's how you do it through the community. And thinking about Tom and James and what you're doing with your business, that's two of you doing these remarkable feats, but mm. trying to take the spirit of that business mm. and that attitude out to so many more. Like, Do you have... Do you have this friction between we are the people doing this thing, but we're trying to inspire so many more people to take this attitude to work? I think so. But I think our biggest strength, and we'll be the first to say it, is that we are pretty much rubbish at everything. And (laughs) our biggest kind of USP is that we can sit in a room and we haven't got 30 years at IBM or we haven't Mm. been from a big consultancy and we're speaking to people on, on a kind of a level playing field. I think what you were saying there about the... The whole input versus output on paper is is very easy to understand. And we work with some of the biggest companies in the world where we'll go in and we'll run a program. And there's that honeymoon period where everyone's saying the right things. And yeah, it's going to be output versus input. And you can go do what you want in your day. That lasts for two weeks and we leave. Right. And then it just takes one person, usually at middle management, to be like, where are you going? It's like, oh, I'm doing my lunchtime run. And it's like, no, 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 no we're busy. Mm. And then it goes back to normal. And I think... It's one of those things where a lot of companies, I think, are saying that it's, you know, their preferred way of working because it's a nice thing to say. But actually, from top down, it's not really running through the company as well as they maybe think it is. I think it's really interesting because we talk about within our future briefing, which is where we consult to businesses to help them become more like us or adopt more progressive ways of working. We talk about purpose, structure and culture. And everyone says they need structure. That's where everyone starts. I want a more agile structure. I want a more Mm -hmm. inclusive structure. And they think culture you don't really need to worry about. But if you don't have culture, you don't change anything, however good your structure is. If you culturally don't change, then it ends up staying the same. And we found the exact same thing. It's middle management. It's not the senior visionaries and it's not the disruptors coming in it's the people that have earned their stripes by getting to a certain level behaving in a certain way for them it is the hardest and so being able to create role models take them on the journey and create the cultural change is probably the hardest thing to do but it's the only thing that creates lasting change because you guys work with so many different companies across the world when you see people getting it right 
what are they doing when you work with the organisations where you think, and I know there are a few that you definitely admire because I see you talking about them, what is it that they're doing differently versus maybe some of the ones which you don't need to name and get sued? Um, uh, I think autonomy is just stands out for me in trust, just trusting people that they're good at their job and that they're going to deliver. And that seems to be the current the theme of what's working and a lot of places that we go into, well, I guess where we feel like we have the biggest impact mm-hmm. isn't necessarily the companies, the, the glossy ones that, that we do like to talk about so much, but it's the the ones that are seen as more archaic and because they've got that tradition, probably similar to the companies that you're talking about as well. And that impact is coming because they, they haven't seen change or potentially scared of change. And that's why the micromanagement is just squashing everything. And that's why the message of just starting with trying to go a day with removing Kant and, and not letting Kant into a meeting has such a big impact because it shuts down everything straight away of, now oh, we can't do that, that will never get signed off. Or, yeah, we can't do that, we've never done it that way before, but if you take that up, at least open the door to like an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Did you ever As think you... that this year? Did you ever think, I don't think we can do this? When you were thinking about El Capitan, you must have had moments yeah, where you both. were thinking, maybe this has gone too far, maybe we can't do this? Or... Do you just sort of live and breathe it every day? No, no definitely. Uh, <laughs> all the time. I think and it, with the more that we do, we get better at trusting the process of okay. the training and the attitude. And I think we're very good at when we do things together, we have ups and downs at different times and yeah. we rely on each other quite heavily to pull the other one through. Because I guess Take the more that. things that you do together, the more that you realise that your strengths and weaknesses as a pair, the trusting the process that together you're able to achieve these brilliant things but individually yeah I I think what adventure gives us is obviously a perspective on running the business and being in the city and the business side of it because I think when we completed the Atlantic we kind of manifested that we removed the word calm and everyone's oh but how did you you know you came back and left your jobs and you had no savings like how do you do that and I think we put it down to the fact we just start asking ourselves like what is the worst thing that could happen by taking this risk and obviously this is from quite a privileged position where we both had good jobs so like we were working in the right industry we had good connections so if our business absolutely bombed after six months we would have gone and got another job and that's the worst case scenario which isn't really a worst case scenario Mm. itself but I think I'm sure everyone around this table will agree with like running a small business we rely hugely on each other when you know your invoice is six months late being paid (laughs) and you're suddenly like okay we can't pay our mortgage this month and having that other person to, it sounds stupid, but be in the same situation as you, which you don't really want anyone to be in that situation as well, but you have someone to kind of moan about it on the phone to, is quite a big asset. And it's the same in adventure, which is why I think, Lauren, like being on your own in that situation takes a whole new level of commitment and bravery in the business aspect. Because if I was on my own, I'd be like, oh my God, mm. it would seem a little bit more daunting. So, Lauren, what do you think from this year that you have learned either about yourself or about the projects that, that you've been working on? Are there some kind of new insights that you've gleaned through? When I look at what you're doing, mate, you're doing so many things like simultaneously and almost feel like you're transitioning to this like next stage of how you're working, the sort of work that you're doing. And I feel like you're going through quite a big process of like discovery, which is what you share with other people, which is so kind of mm. lovely to see. So what, what are you learning, do you think, about yourself? Yeah, it's a good question. And when I was reflecting on it, I think the thing that I really link with this idea of doing, not talking, is practising what you preach. And I think, you know, it's clear I'm in good company here that we all, (laughs) you know, things that we advise our clients to think about and do are things that we've tried out ourselves. And, you know, I do so much work around helping teams and leaders and women in particular around how to you know, find their voice. And it's a bit of a cheesy phrase, but the reality is you can't find your voice unless you're using it. And I realised that I am really good at that in in some ways, but there were other ways that I was kind of unconsciously avoiding. Or kind of fear of what if people think I'm showing Mm. off and what if people think, you know, things that I, that didn't make me feel good. And I thought, actually, I need to step into that. It was a bit like a couple of years ago, I tried stand-up comedy as a kind of, this feels really, really scary, so I'm going to do it to empathise with the type of people that I'm coaching and working with every day. And what's came out of really stepping into that is this 
activity around videos and writing and being visible in different ways and also writing about things that have the potential to make people feel uncomfortable so I wrote something last week about class Mm. because I feel like you know there's a huge amount of content and discussion around diversity and inclusion and huge amount around gender and race which is super important but I don't see that same level of story and conversation about class and that felt a bit scary and felt a bit vulnerable so I teamed up with another woman to write it which was Really lovely. So Sarah Mace, who works at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation and kind of together we put our thoughts on paper and we've had good feedback. It started a conversation that I feel like is important. So I think that's been the big learning for me is to, even though on the outside I probably do lots of things that look a bit scary, I was avoiding some things that I'm now leaning into, which feels good. I love that feeling as well about both the need to be uncomfortable to kind of maybe unlock new Mm. opportunities and potential, but also like you did stand up and you haven't then become a stand up comedian as a result, or maybe you are, maybe it's another one of your things, Mm -hmm. but you've used that experience to then help you with writing. Mm -hmm. It's taught you something else and taking you, like we would talk about squiggly careers, it's almost almost exploration about you and your potential and how you respond to situations that then has unlocked potential for you to go and do other things. And so, Lizzie, this year, I feel like Hoxby has been on a really big transition, actually, this year in terms of positioning. What do you feel you've kind of learned almost through that process? I think that the biggest thing I've learned this year is probably that it's okay to say no, again, Mm channelling your guys' recent podcast, and that the community can do stuff without Alex and I needing to do it all. So this year we've done an enormous amount, and I think some of it is positive leaps forward like the profit share with everyone in the community the rebrand dropping collective feels like real progression for us working with some bigger clients but also I think for me I've learned that I don't need to be part of all of that Mm. we need to lead it we need to maintain our position as the leaders of both the work style movement externally and also the business and the community internally but that that doesn't mean that I can't work three days a week and the biggest thing for me personally this year is at the back end of last year I started swimming again having not swum since I had my son so I had four years away from swimming when I had Mm. swum quite a lot and I started swimming again three days a week and I've done that for the whole year and I don't really have time to do that arguably but I choose to prioritize doing that that's brilliant and I do it on my working days you said you went swimming this morning I did go swimming this morning exactly and you know that meant it was a bit of a rush (laughs) Um, but what it means is I do school drop off then I go swimming and then I don't start work until 9 30 but I am so productive because I have that clarity I'm only in the pool for 15 minutes I just do 30 lengths and get out but during that time I can plan my day I can really think about where I can have the most impact. And actually, it's the thinking time that's as valuable as the exercise. Mm. We know that exercise is really good for mental health, but also I can then think about where am I actually useful because Mm. it's all too easy to get caught up just responding to Slack messages or doing whatever people are asking of you, but it allows me to start the day each day thinking this is where I'm going to have. And it's a commitment to yourself as well. I I imagine Mm. mentally it's quite a healthy thing for you to recognise, even whatever you think about while you're swimming, just the fact that you've done it and you've prioritised that must set you up effectively for the day at the start of the day as well Mm. because it means you start the day feeling it's a bit about feeling in control as well I think I've done this for me it also helps to transition from the mummy mindset into the work mindset for me because I don't have a commute and you know that's brilliant I love not having a commute but the the three steps from the kitchen to where my desk (laughs) is sometimes isn't enough to completely switch (laughs) out of that mode so it's quite a good way of then go by the pool swim and get in the right mode. It's interesting because since I've um, obviously doing more work on Amazing If I very very rarely actually work at home yeah very rarely just because I there is something to me again about like the physical mindset and the place where you spend your time, for whatever reason, has a really big impact on me, actually, in terms of just my productivity, the actual quality of the work that I'm doing. And I very rarely choose to be at home, only really if I think I've got to be somewhere that's very quiet. The rest of the time, I would actually rather be, whether it's like in a cafe or actually sometimes even I don't mind getting you know the train into London because I, I can yeah. do that. And I think 
there is something about those days that is better than if actually, like you say, I drop Max off at nursery and just come home again. It doesn't quite on, work. If it's on your terms, it's amazing. You know, we yeah. talk a lot about choice and the freedom yes. to choose. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And like today, it's exciting to leave Bristol and come to London. Yeah. I haven't been up for a month. You know, I went yeah, to yeah. Germany last week, which I do once a quarter. That's really exciting as well. We sometimes encourage people just to go for a walk, you know, even yeah. if you walk, go for a walk and then come back to your desk. We have an initiative at Hawksby that we're trying to exercise around the world in 365 days. <laughs> we're definitely going to make it. It's just whether we make it before we hit December. But basically, the whole community has a shared Strava group and just tracks all our what exercise. What a good idea. So nice. Because then you're accountable to someone else and you can share your successes when you leave the house and go for a walk, which is a small thing, but makes a big difference, actually, I think, yeah, when you're... Yeah, really nice kind of solitary in terms of your working. You really made me think, actually. I, um, I'm i not a kind of sporty person, so I don't think we're going sure. to be going around the world in three six five days. It'll take us a lot longer. But I did have, like, a morning routine about journaling, and I found that really helpful. But I've dropped it. I think, like, doing the squiggly career tips and having to get them done before 9 o'clock before I go to somewhere else, somewhere in the fitting everything in, I've dropped mm. something that I actually think was probably mentally more important than I recognised. And is that the thing for you? I think that's the risk, particularly for me as a working parent with three children which is quite a lot and the business the thing that can get lost is the time for me mm -hmm. you know and I see my work as my me time and therefore I can rationalise it that way sometimes that oh well that's me indulging myself but actually prioritising journaling and we talk a lot about journaling at Hoxby as well mm -hmm. or exercise or whatever even if it's only half an hour or 15 minutes that can change your whole day and your whole mindset mm -hmm. I think okay journaling tomorrow yeah <laughs> morning routines are quite a funny one aren't they because they get so much air time oh yeah they do oh I hate those um, the bad. million things you've got to do for breakfast yeah. to be successful and I'm not a morning like, person up at four <laughs> And then journal 15, then yeah, meditate, then run, and eat some protein. Start. The miracle morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's also yeah. If you're sleep deprived, none yeah. of that works. Yeah. And none of it nice. counts. We we did a a video on LinkedIn and wrote a blog where we tried to live like a CEO for a week. So oh, we yeah. took five morning routines from like Ariana Huffington uh, yeah. and like Larry Page and people. So. I got up at four every morning for a week to, oh. to clear my inbox. I had no emails. I soon realised I wasn't important enough to be clearing my inbox. I just sat there at 4am like, what am I doing? Then had like a relaxation bath and then did this. You learned like, Spanish, didn't yeah, you? Learned Sp yeah, learned Spanish in a week. Sure. <laughs> That's so funny. But what was the outcome of this week of CEO To never get up at 4am ever yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But did you, you learn anything that. that you would keep or that you would advise I, other people I think, to do? Um, I try all these things out and I'll do them now. Like I'm very bad at every morning doing the same thing. Mm, I've too. actually learned to be like, that's actually okay. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I'm because the same. Because I'll just get bored of the routine after a month or so. But like, but like Duolingo, I, I have done like every day for the last 20 days, every morning for 10 minutes, which isn't a huge part of my day, but it's something that I'm trying to do. But mm -hmm. I think people forget that flexibility is also okay in those morning, evening routines and it doesn't have to be... Oh, I didn't meditate. I'm a bad person, mm. I'm a terrible entrepreneur because I didn't journal. I think a yeah. lot of that, there's quite a lot of pressure on people to kind of almost have a badge of honour on those things. Mm. I think it's that we've talked about it before and people are getting a bit better at it. I think where people talk about self-care, but I do think this idea of it is OK to be good enough at mm. some things. I think that's the other thing is I think people's expectations sometimes of themselves now is like, I need to eat incredibly well, yeah. do an incredible amount of exercise, produce award winning work start four businesses and sometimes I, that's why I kind of go the less shiny side of what we've talked about today is so important because I would hate anyone to think that oh yeah there's six of us that's what we're all doing is getting up at five and like doing all this stuff because you're just not you are definitely good enough at just a load of stuff getting by is what I yeah would say. yeah yeah that's a nice way but most like, people are aren't they I think it's and I think and getting by with other people I think is really really important whether it's the community they're part of or your business partners yeah. or the teams that you're in I think that is what helps the yeah. getting by well and, and having fun doing it mm, is the other yeah. thing like I think that's where love what you do and having fun at work comes into it is that you have to love every aspect of your life when you're juggling a thousand things in one go mm. so if you can do that and you can be honest about what you're doing with everyone yeah I don't know if I buy into to the love every aspect. No, I don't oh, think I do either. Oh, guys, I think I'm actually that's really. <laughs> I was just thinking, I don't yeah. love every aspect really? of what I do. I no. think that message is quite harmful because no. it makes people think, if I don't love every single bit of this, I'm failing. And I think that the reality of anything, whether it's a hobby or a work pursuit or, you know, a career move, is there will be bits of it that you don't yeah, enjoy. Yeah, okay, aspects within it. Yeah. But fundamentally, I think there are too many people that think, to the can't, 
point mm. that James and Tom were making, that they think, I can't change. That's yeah. just yeah, the way the true. world is. Yeah, and my true. job is going to be an unhappy part of my life. Yeah. And I think that's where we feel that there should be a change, that it can't oh, be sure. that your work is just okay being unhappy. Yeah, I agree. If, you, totally. if you're fundamentally passionate about it, then the rough with the smooth won't feel quite so rough. Yeah. I think the thing that has maybe surprised me a little bit this year is I think I had this perception of, you know, when you're running your own thing, oh, it's all going to be amazing and rosy and you're going to love every single second. Oh, and it the turns, lows, the and lows it, are and low. It, and it turns out, I mean, obviously it's not Helen's fault. Um, <laughs> but some of it, you go, is not that fun. And you almost feel this expectation, I think, of like, it should all be amazing. And then you realise actually it's like lots of other jobs where... There are some bits I, I do love, loads more I love than I don't. But occasionally, of course, there are still things that are not as good. And actually, I think when you're doing your own thing, the things that are hard are harder because you take it really personally because you're going, oh, well, that thing didn't go very well and I did that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sort of accountable for kind of making that work. And I think that links back to the culture, culture at work mm. thing that we're talking about and that we all, human beings, have such a negativity bias. So we're, mm. you know, a lot of the clients we work with, you know, they're so good at talking about all the things that are wrong, mm. all the things that will never work, all the things that they invested in that didn't happen. And it's like, well, you need to make an extra conscious effort to celebrate. And we do a lot of work with teams on like, how do you celebrate? How yeah. do you appreciate each Love other? That. Really you know, nice. It can be a confetti drawer or every Friday you have coffee together. You know, it doesn't need to be mm. yeah, I think small grand wins. gestures. And we've been kind of grappling with how we do that when we're a distributed team because there's only so far that, you know, the 20 yeah. slack emojis <laughs> can go when you've just like landed a big new client and you yeah. really need Everyone's just emoji, emoji, emoji. Yes, emoji. Like, oh. <laughs> and I think, you know, we've not figured that out yet. Because human beings don't really know how to work at this scale in such a distributed way because we've never had the technology to let us do mm. that before. And that's what we say at Nobel a lot. is like, don't beat yourselves up because you don't know how to do this. Nobody does. From the Amazons to the Unilevers to the Spotify, you know, no matter where you sit on that scale, we're all grappling with these same problems of how you design a culture that works for individuals works for the teams and ultimately will help the company become a success i love that about having more celebration though i think i think we should put mm. that out to our audience about how do they celebrate their wins and see yeah. if they inspire mm. people i think that's the best thing about running your own business is the the celebration of those wins because when you're, you're working for a big corporate and yeah you maybe bring on a whole new piece of work that you might get commission on you might not you're doing it for someone else aren't you you're at the end of the day, it's for a, a wider company. And when it's just you on your own or you and your co-founder or whatever, it's like, yes, that's us. Like that win is come from us, it's for us. And the feeling just seems to be amplified. I think that's what you get kind of addicted to, isn't it? Mm, yeah. You're probably nine out, ten, <laughs> nine out of ten. Nine out of ten are actually disappointments where, you know, oh, we've actually got a new CMO, so that whole thing is now scrapped. Mm -hmm. It's like that's eight months of everyone's like, <laughs> we all went, oh, oh, new CMO. <laughs> Well, it's like new people generally. Isn't yeah, we're really going through change. It's yeah. like, why is everyone going through change? I think, I think we're the, the change. It's not you, it's me. So we're going to do some um, Christmas presents in a minute. But just before we move on to that, and I suspect what might end up being slightly chaotic, um, <laughs> I'd just love to ask each of you one thing you're really excited about for next year. It can be something personal, professional, but just something where you think about in the next 12 months, what's something you're really looking forward to? And to kind of Lauren's point around being positive, being upbeat and kind of putting that mindset and mentality kind of going into a new year because it's just inevitable, isn't it, that when you get to the end of the year, you start to think about kind of the year ahead. Who wants to start? I'll start. Okay. So I think a big part of Dose and The Tempest 2 is about obviously learning new things. And as part of our development, we are learning that we get the most from the people that we hang around with and the people that we spend time with. The last climb being a good example of that is we got to train with and spend some time with a guy called Alex Honold, who's the famous free solo climber who climbed El Capitan with no ropes. But we got to spend a good few days with him and get a total insight into what goes on in his mind and his mindset. We can take that, apply it to our own experience, but also combine that with our experience when we're talking to various okay. teams. And for what... We don't know what we've got planned exactly next year, but we know it's going to involve something pretty crazy and scary <laughs> for <Sure>. us. <laughs> but it's also going to involve us meeting some incredible, amazing people and getting an insight into what goes through their mind and their mm. practices and what makes them tick. And we get a chance to apply that into our day-to-day -day and then take that being, you know, not more normal is the wrong way to say it, but more like the people that we deal with on a day-to-day 
and try and help them embed the things that we found valuable and, and see what difference that makes. And do that's you have exciting. A, an amazing, crazy wish list? Like, do you just clap to these things on there? Or... In an A1 book? <laughs> <laughs> our, our wish list is digital, sorry. <laughs> that's a Trello board. But yeah, it's, it's usually, we, we have a... Um, Christmas party every year, which is just the two of us. Yeah, we do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. just basically, two of us. Yeah, which is basically we bring post its. What do you have? We we just bring a notepad that we usually yeah. lose at the end of the night. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll write down. I think space is on there, which is very broad. Okay. Um, but we'll write down these twenty things, and they get more and more ambitious the more mojitos you have. And then you sit down in the morning and go right. They're all impossible, or they cost ten million quid. And that's kind of how we set our goals for adventure. Amazing. Um, but on that, I think what I'm excited about is Dose has kind of now taken shape as we kind of know exactly what it is. For the last year or so when we founded it, we've kind of been hustling it and changing it a little bit here and there. But we're building a, a board of advisors from our network of people who we respect the most, advising us on you know where we should go from people from Airbnb. I'm really looking forward to getting those people in a room and being like, right, we know we don't know what we're doing. Help us. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Be like, what, what would you do here? And actually listening and absorbing and hopefully learning from them. Oh. But we've, I think we've got five or six at the moment. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to, yeah, starting next year, sitting down, having a dinner and being like, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice that both of yours, what you're both looking forward to next year is uh, the people that you're going to spend time yeah, with, 100%. essentially. The people that you're going to learn from who perhaps have scaled even more heights than, than you, yeah. physically and literally, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, and actually the people who are going to help you with your business. I think often people think, oh, it's going to be achievements. It's going to be a thing that you're going to mm. kind of name. But actually neither of you said, oh, I'm excited about, I know you don't quite know your next challenge yet, but you didn't really even go to that territory, which is really nice. And in that little chat, you mentioned the word help three times. Mm. And just a bit of a shout out, last week's podcast, Squiggly Careers podcast, was on how to ask for help because it sounds like you've got quite comfortable with saying, mm. this is oh. what we can't do and we need some help, please. Yeah, yeah. Lots of people aren't so comfortable mm. and it stops them from kind of realising their potential. So if you are one of those people listening, then last week's podcast, I think it's episode 110, yep. is all about how to ask for help. So it might be a, a good listen. Lauren, what are you excited about? So I'm excited but with mixed feelings. Mixed excitement. Mixed excitement <laughs> because my baby goes to nursery Ooh. in February. Ooh. Big moment. Yeah, so I just know that that means 2020 will... Be bring, different. Yeah, be different and bring a whole new set of stuff that I don't know what that's going to be. And I'm sure some of it will be great and some of it will mean I will cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that feels big. And also I've been working on an online course for Upfront for nearly two years now and Ooh. I've been feeling really frustrated and getting impatient because it all, you know, as side projects do, they, it falls down the list. But I've booked in, I've got a whole week of filming happening in December, so I think right. it should be ready for kind of February next year. And that feels, it's less about the thing and more about because it's, been ongoing for such a long time I'm just really excited to finally get have out it be real and kind of release it tomorrow. oh well let us know let us know yeah, as soon as you've got it let thank us know you. and we'll, we'll share, share it with them. yeah thank you and Lizzie 2020 Ooh. um we haven't told anyone that we're doing this yet. <gasps> oh, it's yeah. exclusive. It is. exclusive. <laughs> it's an exclusive. Um, <laughs> in our world of Have work. you told Alex? <laughs> yeah. The sort of thing I do, like, Alex. don't announce me without telling Helen first. <laughs> Alex knows. Alex knows. So next year we are launching the Hoxby Foundation um, in January, which we already, obviously everything we do is purpose-led. We're a social enterprise. We exist to create a happier, more fulfilled society through a world of work without bias. But the Hoxby Foundation, um, we have been quietly donating 5% of our profits to the Hoxby Foundation. And next year, we'll be launching that in partnership with various charities and other initiatives in order to specifically focus on pro bono work. Um, we won't make any profit to look at driving change and how we can scale that change, which is what Hoxby is fundamentally all about and so I'm really excited to see how that can hopefully start to scale the impact of what we're doing. Right, are we going to do our Let's presents? do presents. Sarah's mm. wrapped them and they're in a certain order yeah. so I can't touch them, everybody. So, so. Um, we're going to give them out one by one. I am actually a bit worried. So the, rule, the rules, <laughs> I've got rules for the presents, basically. Okay. So I'm going to give them out. Gonna she pretends she's all nice yeah. and free-thinking, but there are rules. She is the organiser. She like, like, like rules. You must more, pretend to like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rule number one. Actually, I didn't think of that. No, more, the main rule is I am worried that you might have what you're opening. So the rule is if you already have it, you are allowed to swap it with a fellow guest. One in particular I am particularly worried about now 
having listened to our chat, I'm like, oh, no. Okay. So let's see. Uh, let's see how we get on. I think um, I know. <laughs> It's more exciting than Christmas itself because <laughs> normally okay. Christmas is all about giving. So, L- Lizzie, you don't need to read the card. It just says, it just says, it just says thank you. Okay. Full <laughs> Shall, I, Shall I open it loudly? So yeah, the crinkle, crinkle. You can hear the crinkly opening of the... It, yes. Have you already I've got already it? I've already got this book. Okay, okay. <laughs> right, wait. <laughs> right, so book number one Love is Bruce Joy, Joy of Work, yeah. Bruce Daisley. Wait. Okay. <laughs> there could be some swapping going on. Yeah, you haven't inscribed it inside it. So... Because I'm going to also anticipate that we might have got these wrong, that Laura might also have hers. Okay. So well, maybe you'll ideal. be able to But we could do some swapping. Maybe we can... Swap. Have you... Oh, no, I don't oh, oh, in which case you have to keep it. <laughs> so <laughs> Lauren has thought... Right, Lizzie, you might be able to swap. No, no. So Lauren... Is... Let It Go by Dame Stephanie Shirley. Her extraordinary yeah. story. Before Frozen launched with Let It Go. <laughs> <laughs> the original. Yeah, so That's true. <laughs> so uh, we interviewed um, Dame Stephanie Shirley for the podcast earlier this year. And I was thinking about a book that I thought would be good for Lauren. And I think what Dame Stephanie Shirley did is she was incredibly progressive and then incredibly giving. And I was thinking with all the things that you're trying to do, I felt like, A, you have got a lot in common. I think when you read that, you'll you'll see you've got a lot in common. Um, And so I thought you could read that. And a bit like you were saying, you've been really inspired by Greta Thunberg this year. Maybe uh, she'll do the same for you. Thank you very much. So let's see whether some of the others might be able to swap. Right. (laughs) <laughs> okay, James. Love this James is. Thank you. I mean, it is a book, so they're, 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 they're all books, book. unfortunately. The shape is a giveaway. Yeah. Ooh. Have you have you already got it? No. Okay. Tell us what you've got. No hard feelings, emotions at work, and how they help us succeed. So that is one of my favourite Instagram accounts as well. Mm-hmm. Do you follow them? Do you work. follow them on Instagram? No. No, so all great. of their Instagram is all illustrations. And it's all about introverts, extroverts. It's funny and quite knowing. And I always feel like you guys are funny. You always make me laugh. But also I think a lot of what you're talking to organisations around in terms of how they interact, that it's okay to have emotions. But I think what both uh, Lizzie and Molly do really well is it's very grounded in the real world. So they have jobs as illustrators. They work, one of them works at IDEO. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just, especially with your advisory board, I think they would also all Amazing. be really That's a great show. Molly West Duffy was also on the podcast. So all of these books are yes. previous podcast guests as well. So that looks amazing. To... That is a great shout. Thank you very no much. No worries. And I think if you don't want to swap with Lizzie, we have got a bonus book, haven't we? I have we? got a bonus book. So I, bonus book. I can, maybe, I can switch I one want? out with you. I want the squiggly career. Can I get it before the 9th of January? Oh, <laughs> Lizzie, you can, you can pre-order. I feel like we've paid you to say that. No, no. So, Tom, what have you got? I have got Winning Not Fighting, which I haven't read. Okay. <sighs> Do you know John? Do you know what no, he is? No, I don't. So John is the founder of Leon. Do you know uh, Leon? Yes, I do oh. know Leon. Mm. <laughs> yes. His book is all about the art of Wing Chun, which is actually about how you win by not fighting. And so John talks about actually how in the business world there's a lot of like fighting language, like the mm-hmm. chief executive mm. and target customers. And it's very sort of battle and almost aggressive in its actions. That Wing Chun is all about how you... It's a martial arts, which is almost about stepping away from the battle Incredible. to win the battle. Really, really interesting. Lots of... Thank you so the much. The language... Thank you. Um, the stuff in there around language is also really powerful, mm, isn't it? Yeah. So talk a lot about how we use so much language day to day that is all to do with like war. Like hustle. The war yeah. metaphor. And right just like there, war metaphors yeah. and stuff. And yeah, it's quite a deep read, okay. I would say. It takes a bit of like absorbing yourself into quite reflective. They're very different. So I thought also you could swap. Well, read and swap. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Which, I'll race you. Yeah. I think, <laughs> no. you, would, I think you would win. And as Lizzie, right. Lizzie <laughs> already had race. her book, which is The Joy of Work, which we just should just talk about. So The Joy of Work is uh, mm. written by Bruce Daisley, previous podcast guest. And we chose this for you because Hoxby's all around putting the joy and, as you said, the fun into work. So it's probably testament to how good a book Bruce it is, is. Yeah. and how good Bruce is that you've already got this one but we also have a bonus book so I think you're the Brilliant. ultimate Christmas present yeah. yep. so the bonus book that I brought along is a book called Be More Pirate has anyone read it? yeah great book Yeah. yeah. most importantly Lizzie hasn't I have not read Excellent. it, <laughs> not read it. <laughs> so uh, this by a guy called Sam Conniff who hasn't been on the podcast yet but is coming on the mm-hmm. podcast and essentially he talks about how to do rebellion but in a day to day way Nice. so not rebellion by deconstructing all of society but essentially creating your own rebellions plus the the cover's bright pink, which is awesome. <laughs> so let me swap. Lauren, have you got Joy of Work? 
No. no. Well, Lauren's not got nothing. Oh, Pass it on. I know, but she can have two. Oh, okay. oh wow. Oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I was like, if she's not got joy of work, I think also lots of relevant stuff in there for Noble. Thank and you I think so you'll much. find it you'll find it interesting. <laughs> so thank you all so much for joining us on our Christmas party podcast. It's the first time we've ever done one of these. So hopefully hope you, you have fun. found it right. fun. And hopefully yeah. everyone listening has found it fun too. <laughs> uh, we should just, as we say goodbye, if there's anywhere we can send our listeners to to find out more about the work. So Tom, James, Dost, uh, Yeah, I mean... Follow us on Instagram at the Tempest Two, which is T W O, and the Dose stuff is uh, Dose dot work. Brilliant, thank you. And Lauren, there's so many things that you're doing. Where should we send everyone to? So I'm Red Jotter on Instagram and Twitter, redjotter.com and Nobel N O B L dot I O. Brilliant, thank you, Lizzie hoxby.com or search for Workstyle Freestyle on YouTube. Okay, and we will do a post on amazingif.com. We'll put all the links in the description for the podcast so that you can find all of that stuff as well as searching for it. We'll make it as easy as possible for you to connect with everybody. So thank you very much for listening. We know this is a slightly longer podcast than normal, but hope it has brought you some festive cheer and some inspiration for everything that you're going to do in 2020. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.